It is natural, in view of this very awkward circumstance, that many scholars should not only cast doubt on the story of Sun Wu as given in the Shi Chi, but even show themselves frankly skeptical as to the existence of the man at all. The most powerful presentment on this side of the case is to be found in the following disposition by Ye Shui Sin. 17. It is stated in the Suma Qian history that Sun Wu was a native of the Qi state, and employed by Wu, and that in the reign of Hou Lu he crushed Chu, entered Ying, and was a great general. But in So's commentary, no Sun Wu appears at all. It is true that So's commentary need not contain absolutely everything that other histories contain, but So has not omitted to mention vulgar plebeians and hireling ruffians, such as Ying Kuo Shu, 18, Sao Kue, 19, Chu Chi Wu, and Chua Shi Shu, 20. In the case of Sun Wu, whose fame and achievements were so brilliant, the omission is much more glaring. Again, details are given in their due order about his contemporaries Wu Yan and the minister Pie. 21. Is it credible that Sun Wu alone should have been passed over? In point of literary style, Sun Tzu's work belongs to the same school as Quan Tzu, 22, Liu Tao, 23, and Yue Yu, 24, and may have been the production of some private scholar living towards the end of the spring and autumn, or the beginning of the Warring States period. 25. The story that his precepts were actually applied by the Wu state is merely the outcome of big talk on the part of his followers. From the flourishing period of the Chao Dynasty, 26, down to the time of the spring and autumn, all military commanders were statesmen as well, and the class of professional generals for conducting external campaigns did not then exist. It was not until the period of the Six States, 27, that this custom changed. Now, although Wu was an uncivilized state, it is conceivable that So should have left unrecorded the fact that Sun Wu was a great general and yet held no civil office? What we are told, therefore, about Zhang Chu, 28, and Sun Wu is not authentic matter, but the reckless fabrication of theorizing pundits. The story of Ho Lu's experiment on the women in particular is utterly preposterous and incredible. Ye Shui Sin represents Su Ma Qian as having said that Sun Wu crushed Chu and entered Ying. This is not quite correct. No doubt the impression left on the reader's mind is that he at least shared in the exploits. The fact may or may not be significant, but it is nowhere explicitly stated in the Shi Qi either that Sun Tzu was general on the occasion of the taking of Ying, or that he even went there at all. Moreover, as we know that Wu Yan and Po Pie both took part in the expedition, and also that its success was largely due to the dash and enterprise of Fu Kai, Olu's younger brother, it is not easy to see how yet another general could have played a very prominent part in the same campaign. Chin Chin Sun of the Sung Dynasty has the note. Military writers look upon Sun Wu as the father of their art, but the fact that he does not appear in the Sochuan, although he is said to have served under Ho Lu, King of Wu, makes it uncertain what period he really belonged to. He also says, The works of Sun Wu and Wu Qi may be of genuine antiquity. It is noticeable that both Ye Shui Sun and Qin Qin Sun while rejecting the personality of Sun Wu as he figures in the Suma Qian's history, are inclined to accept the date traditionally assigned to the work which passes under his name. The author of Su Lu fails to appreciate this distinction, and consequently his bitter attack on Qin Qin Sun really misses its mark. He makes one of two points, however, which certainly tell in favor of the high antiquity of our thirteen chapters. Sun Tzu, he says, must have lived in the age of Qing Wang, 519 to 476, because he is frequently plagiarized in subsequent works of the Chao Qin and Han dynasties. The two most shameless offenders in this respect are Wu Qi and Huan Nan Zhu, both of them important historical personages in their day. The former lived only a century after the alleged date of Sun Tzu, and his death is known to have taken place in 381 BC.
It was to him, according to Lu Xiang, that Sing Xin delivered the So Chuan, which had been entrusted to him by its author. 29. Now, the fact that quotations from the Art of War, acknowledged or otherwise, are to be found in so many authors of different epochs, establishes a very strong interior to them all. In other words, that Sun Tzu's treatise was already in existence towards the end of the 5th century BC. Further proof of Sun Tzu's antiquity is furnished by the archaic or wholly obsolete meanings attaching to a number of the words he uses. A list of these, which might perhaps be extended, is given in the Su Lu, and though some of the interpretations are doubtful, the main argument is hardly affected thereby. Again, it must not be forgotten that Ye Shui Sin, a scholar and critic of the first rank, deliberately pronounces the style of the thirteen chapters to belong to an early part of the fifth century. Seeing that he is actually engaged in an attempt to disprove the existence of Sun Wu himself, we may be sure that he would not have hesitated to assign the work to a later date, had he not honestly believed the contrary. And it is precisely on such a point that the judgment of an educated Chinaman will carry most weight. Other internal evidence is not far to seek. Thus, in 13 SS1, there is an unmistakable allusion to the ancient system of land tenure which had already passed away by the time of Mencius, who was anxious to see it revived in a modern form. 30. The only warfare Sun Tzu knows is carried on between the various feudal princes in which armored chariots play a large part. Their use seems to have entirely died out before the end of the Chao dynasty. He speaks as a man of Wu, a state which ceased to exist as early as 473 BC. On this I shall touch presently. But once refer the work to the 5th century or earlier, and the chances of its being other than a bona fide production are sensibly diminished. The great age of forgeries did not come until long after. That it should have been forged in the period immediately following 473 is particularly unlikely, for no one as a rule hastens to identify themselves with a lost cause. As for Ye Shui Xin's theory that the author was a literary recluse, that seems to me quite untenable. If one thing is more apparent than another after reading the maxims of Sun Tzu, is that their essence has been distilled from a large store of personal observation and experience. They reflect the mind of not only a born strategist, gifted with a rare faculty of generalization, but also a practical soldier closely acquainted with the military conditions of his time. To say nothing of the fact that these sayings have been accepted and endorsed by all the greatest captains of Chinese history, they offer a combination of freshness and sincerity, acuteness and common sense, which quite excludes the idea that they were artificially concocted in the study. If we admit, then, that the thirteen chapters were the genuine production of a military man living towards the end of the Chunchu period, are we not bound, in spite of the silence of the Sochuan, to accept Sima Qian's account in its entirety? In view of his high repute as a sober historian, must we not hesitate to assume that the records he drew upon for Sun Wu's biography were false and untrustworthy? The answer, I fear, must be in the negative. There is still one grave, if not fatal, objection to the chronology involved in the story as told in the Shi Qi, which, so far as I am aware, nobody has yet pointed out. There are two passages in Sun Tzu in which he alludes to contemporary affairs. The first is in 6 SS 21. Though according to my estimate the soldiers of UA exceed our own in number, that shall advantage them nothing in the matter of victory. I say then that victory can be achieved. The other is in 11 SS 30. Asked if an army can be made to imitate the Shuaijan, I should answer yes. For the men of Wu and the men of Yue are enemies, yet, if they are crossing a river in the same boat and are caught by a storm, they will come to each other's assistance, just as the left hand helps the right. These two paragraphs are extremely valuable as evidence of the date of composition. They assign the work to the period of the struggle between Wu and Yue. So much has been observed by Pai Lis Sun. But, what has hitherto escaped notice is that they also seriously impair the credibility of the Sumachian's Machian's narrative. As we have seen above, the first positive date given in connection with Sun Wu is 512 BC. He is then spoken of as a general, 
acting as confidential advisor to Ho Lu so that his alleged introduction to that monarchy had already taken place. And of course, the 13 chapters must have been written earlier still. But at that time, and for several years after, down to the capture of Ying in 506, Chu, and not Yue, was the greatest hereditary enemy of Wu. The two states, Chu and Wu, had been constantly at war for over half a century. 31. Whereas the first war between Wu and Yue was waged only in 510. 32. And even then was no more than a short interlude sandwiched in the midst of the fierce struggling with Chu. Now, Chu is not mentioned in the 13 chapters at all. The natural inference is that they were written at a time when Yue had become the prime antagonist of Wu. That is, after Chu had suffered the great humiliation of 506. At this point, a table of dates may be found useful. BC 514 Ascension of Holu 512 Holu attacks Chu, but is dissuaded from entering Ying, the capital. Shi Qi mentions Sun Wu as general. 511. Another attack on Chu. 510. Wu makes a successful attack on Yue. This is the first war between the two states. 509. Chu invades Wu, but is significantly defeated at Yu Chang. 506. Ho Lu attacks Chu with the aid of Tang and Sai. Decisive battle of Po Chu and capture of Ying. Last mention of Sun Wu and Shi Qi. 505. Yue makes a raid on Wu in the absence of its army. Wu is beaten by Qin and evacuates Ying. 504. Ho Lu sends Fu Chai to attack Chu. 497. Cao Qian becomes king of Yue. 496. Wu attacks Yue, but is defeated by Ko Qin at Su Li. Ho Lu is killed. 494. Fu Chai defeats Ku Qin in the Great Battle of Fu Chiao and enters the capital of Yue. 485 or 484. Cao Qin renders the homage to Wu. Death of Wu Su Su. 482. Cao Qian invades Wu in the absence of Fu Chai. 478 to 476. Further attacks by Yue on Wu. 475. Cao Qian lays siege to the capital of Wu. 473. Final defeat and extinction of Wu. The sentence quoted above from 6 SS21 hardly strikes me as one that could have been written in a full flush of victory. It seems rather to imply that, for the moment at least, the tide had turned against Wu, and that she was getting the worst of the struggle. Hence we may conclude that our treatise was not in existence in 505, before which date Yue does not appear to have scored any notable success against Wu. Ho Lu died in 496, so that if the book was written for him, it must have been during the period 505 to 496, when there was a lull in the hostilities. Wu having presumably been exhausted by its supreme efforts against Chu. On the other hand, if we choose to disregard the tradition connecting Sun Wu's name with Ho Lu, it might equally well have seen the light between 496 and 494 or possibly in the period 482 to 473, when Yue was once again becoming a very serious menace. 33. We may feel fairly certain that the author, whoever he may have been, was not a man of any great eminence in his own day. On this point, the negative testimony of the So Chuan far outweighs any shred of authority still attaching to the Shi Qi, if once its other facts are discredited. Sun Xing Yin, however, makes a feeble attempt to explain the omission of his name from the Great Commentary. It was Wu Zhu Su, he says, who got all the credit of Sun Wu's exploits, because the latter, being an alien, was not rewarded with an office in the state. How then did the Sun Tzu legend originate? It may be that the growing celebrity of the book imparted by degrees a kind of factitious renown to its author. It was felt to be only right and proper that one so well versed in the science of war should have solid achievements to his credit as well. 
Now, the capture of Ying was undoubtedly the greatest feat of the arms of Ho Lu's reign. It made a deep and lasting impression on all the surrounding states and raised Wu to the short-lived zenith of her power. Hence, what more natural as time went on than the acknowledged master's strategy, Sun Wu should be popularly identified with that campaign. At first, perhaps only in the sense that his brain conceived and planned it. Afterwards, that it was actually carried out by him in conjunction with Wu Yan, 34. Popie and Fu Kai. It is obvious that any attempt to reconstruct even the outline of Sun Tzu's life must be based almost wholly on conjecture. With this necessary proviso, I should say that he probably entered the service of Wu about the time of Ho Lu's accession, and gathered experience, though only in the capacity of a subordinate officer, during the intense military activity which marked the first half of the prince's reign. 35. If he rose to be a general at all, he certainly was never on an equal footing with the three above mentioned. He was doubtless present at the investment and occupation of Ying, and witnessed Wu's sudden collapse in the following year. Yue's attack at this critical juncture, when her rival was embarrassed on every side, seems to have convinced him that this upstart kingdom was the great enemy against whom every effort would henceforth have to be directed. Sun Wu was thus a well-seasoned warrior when he sat down to write his famous book, which according to my reckoning must have appeared towards the end rather than the beginning of Ho Lu's reign. The story of the women may possibly have grown out of some real incident occurring about the same time. As we hear no more of Sun Wu after this from any source, he is hardly likely to have survived his patron or to have taken part in the death struggle with Yue, which began with the disaster at Sui Li. If these inferences are approximately correct, there is a certain irony in the fate which decreed that China's most illustrious man of peace should be contemporary with her greatest writer on war. Thank you all for listening. Whether you found my content enjoyable or detestable, please give a thumbs up or down, share the video with others, subscribe and contribute to the discussion via my Twitter or Minds.com channel, join the community at our Discord server through the invite link below, and engage with your fellow watcher via the comments below that. If you'd like to support the Zilver with a Z channel and allow me to take on idiocy and reach out to friends and fans on social media, and keep the channel going and get rewarded for it, I would ask you to donate monthly via Patreon. You can do this by following the link to my Patreon and becoming my patron, or if you wish to donate only once, a PayPal tip jar is listed above that in the description. Till then, everyone... This has been Zilver with a Z.